looks like it's live. All right, hang on. Uh, just gotta make sure we got audio and stuff. All right. Wanna go to this one. All right. Should be good to go. Uh, if you guys could just let me know, make sure audio and video is good. It looks like it's all right. I'm just, all right, it looks like it's working on my uh, iPad here. All right, I think it's good to go. All right, cool. All right, let me move this aside. Look at the camera. All right, guys, so thanks for stopping by. I got the Sony a6700 in hand right here. Um, been using this for a couple of days now. I got a bunch of lenses to play with it um, as well. Right now I got on there the, uh, if I switch camera angles right here, I got the, let me zoom in a little bit. I got the 16 to 55 millimeter f 2.8 G lens, which I reviewed. I didn't really like this lens too much because it was so heavy and expensive um, and it had a lot of distortion at the 16 millimeter mark, but phenomenal optic uh, nonetheless. And um, what else do I got here? Oh, I have the uh, 70 to 200, of course. This guy, the new one. This thing is a beast, by the way, absolute beast. I tested it quite a bit on the A6700, but now I need to test it on the full frame A7 IV. So guys, please uh, do me a favor. Be sure to get those questions in. If you have any questions about the A6700, for example, um, that new 70 to 200 millimeter lens, I'm gonna try to address that stuff first. Um, but of course, if you have other questions, by all means, you know, ask away. So I just wanted to go over the um, the A6700 quick for those that aren't too familiar with it. I mean, I'm like a YouTube person, so obviously I watched a couple of reviews already. So and I'm familiar with this camera, but I'm assuming a lot of you guys have not. Um, some of you probably have. But the basics of this new camera, it's the same price as the A6600. So it looks like it's going to go for right around, let's see, is it 1200? I can't remember. Uh, no, it's 1400, just the camera body. So that's the same price as the A6600, which honestly, I was surprised because I was like, you know, obviously Sony's gonna update it with better stuff. So as it turns out though, they updated a bunch of stuff, but they didn't really do what I was hoping for. I was really hoping for a stacked sensor um, like that new Fuji has, uh, APS-C stacked sensor. That would have been awesome because it would have been like zero rolling shutter, um, but those sensors are so expensive that would have pushed this camera to another price bracket. Sorry guys, I keep forgetting to switch the camera back. I apologize, I'm like talking with my hands like an idiot. Um, but anyways, so the, uh, the stack sensor situation. So I was hoping for that. Now the problem is it'll raise the price of the camera. I don't know how much, and that's what is the unknown. All the cameras with stack sensors are like really expensive. Uh, the Canon R3, the A9, the A1, for example. Um, very expensive cameras, flagship, you know, units is what they seem to be holding out for with the stack sensors. But I think it's only a matter of time before they end up coming our way. So I think Sony's going to come out with a 7000 series to replace, remember the Next 7 back in the day was a 7 series. So that was like their professional mirrorless uh, crop factor camera. And it was a really nice camera body. Um, I loved it. I actually had it um, for a while. So I think Sony's going to come out with a 7000 series that will have the stack sensor. Um, maybe not this year, maybe next year, not sure. But that will be like the badass APS-C camera in the future, like for sports and weddings and, and things like that as a second camera, um, in my opinion. So that being said, the A6600 does have quite a few upgrades. So let me just go over the camera body really quick um, for those of you um, that are not aware of some of these changes. So I'm just going to go over some of the basic, most important fundamental changes in my opinion, and it's this dial here on the front of the grip. They also changed the way the grip feels because of this dial, this notch here moved down a little bit. So um, that just changed the ergonomics of the grip. And I also noticed I, I don't know if I'm correct about this because I don't have the A6600 in hand, but the rubber feels just a little bit more rubbery. So I could be wrong about that, but that's what it feels like to me. Now, they also changed the on and off switch. This switch is less, it, it's harder to turn the camera on and off with this switch. The switch was up here more on the older cameras. Let's say I have the 
uh, a 6400 here. You can see where the switch is. It's like over on the left side when you turn it on and off. So I find that this one accidentally turns on and off a lot more than this design. So I think Sony was trying to address the accidentally turning the camera on and off uh, with this update with the toggle here. Not really sure, um, but that's what I noticed there. Now also right here, we have another dial underneath the mode dial, which I really like. Uh, you don't need to hold an extra button to turn it or anything. It's got pretty strong feedback, so you are not gonna accidentally turn this dial. It's like very firm, but not too firm, just like right where you want it. And this dial here also has really good feedback. So looking at it from the back, we have the flippy screen. Now this is the same one million dot screen. We have the viewfinder, it's the same viewfinder. It's not like a new viewfinder. It's like two million pixels for the viewfinder, but the viewfinder is twice as bright and that is very noticeable. Like when you're looking through the viewfinder, it's way brighter. Um, so just that alone makes it look better. <laughs> it, it's not really that much better though, uh, but the brightness does help. So I like that, that's a nice upgrade. And of course this, the you know flippy screen is cool. On the side, uh, Sony, now you have a memory card slot on the side of the camera. It used to be in the battery compartment. Um, so it's very nice that they moved it to the side. And then of course we have a USB-C port now. So it's a USB-C, which is very nice. And why the USB-C is so important is because now you can power the camera with PD power. So if you have a, uh, like a good power brick that's like, you know, 50 watts or whatever, and it has a PD on it for PD power, you can plug that into the camera and power the camera with that. You still have to have the battery in there, but the, the camera won't like go down. Like the battery will stay at like 100% um, if you're using a PD power source. And that's awesome um, for extended recording. Uh, however, you're not really going to be doing too much extended recording with this camera, unfortunately, because it overheats. Now, um, the newer Sony cameras that have been coming out have been overheating pretty quick. The ZV-E1, the full frame, uh, you know, it's, it's like a, um, I just recently reviewed it. It's an awesome camera, but it overheats. And, you know, a camera with that kind of power, you know, 4K 60, 4K 120, you might think that you're going to be able to record long form and stuff and and you just can't and this kind of falls into the same boat and i was a little disappointed uh, about that to be honest with you so gerald undone did some testing i watched his video it was good um he got quite a bit of recording time on it he got like way over an hour uh 4k 24 10 bit um but other people testing it did not have the same luck they only got like 30 minutes 40 minutes so it seems to be depending. And the same thing goes for the ZV-E1. People got different recording times, you know, depending. Now, of course, ambient temperature is gonna matter. If you're in an, a studio like I'm in and you have a climate controlled environment, like 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, you should be good to go for, I would say, at least 45 minutes, if not an hour. Um, the testing I've seen has been a little bit hotter than that. It's been about 75, 76, and those are overheating fairly quick. Um, so 4K 60 is going to overheat faster. 4K 120 is going to overheat really fast. So probably 15 minutes, 4K 120. Um, again, depending on the ambient temperature. So it is what it is. I was hoping this would have some kind of like newer heat dissipation in there, uh, kind of like the A7S 3 has, because there's no fan on the A7S 3, but it doesn't overheat. So they have some kind of magic thermal going on but um, they did not include that in the A6700 or the ZV-E1, unfortunately. I really wish they did. Um, I think they're doing that because they want people to buy the FX30 and the FX3 if you're doing long form video. Those cameras are made for long form video. They have the active cooling fan in there and they're just better cameras for that purpose. This is a photo first hybrid camera. So Sony's kind of like weighing it out, I feel like. Now, if they made this thing where, where it didn't overheat, they would have to increase the price. And that might now push it and be a direct competitor to the FX30. I feel like they're trying to like segment their line, cinema line, you know, hybrid camera type thing. It just is what it is. Um, one other thing I forgot to point out was the record button is on the top of the camera as well, right here. It's got a nice record button. Uh, so they moved that from the side where this custom button was and uh, where, where this custom button is. Now this is a custom button. Uh, I forgot to mention that. So what else we got here? Um, let me just go through some of the uh, some of the other specs 
quickly, and uh, and then we'll go on to some of these questions. I, it looks like we have a whole bunch of questions. This is awesome. Uh, so thanks for that. And uh, feel free to hammer away. I, uh, I I'm going to read through these comments in a second, so just stand by. Um, but one of the couple of things I just wanted to tell you about this camera, it's got a new sensor, 26 megapixel. Now it's the same sensor from the FX30. So it's a pretty good sensor, but it's not a stack sensor like I was talking about earlier. Now it's got 759 uh, phase detection autofocus points. However, if you're recording in video, that drops down to like 450 uh, phase detection autofocus points. So you might not know that, but video autofocus is not gonna be as good as photo because of that. So that's worth noting. Um, it has the real-time tracking. It's got the AI chip in here. And the autofocus is unbelievable. It really does work awesome. I've been using it with multiple lenses and it just, it works awesome. So it, Sony has pretty much the best autofocus for the majority of stuff that you're shooting. Um, I would say Canon has an edge when it comes to wildlife shooting. For some reason, the Canon cameras just lock onto a bird uh, way better than Sony does. I don't know why that is because Sony seems to be better in every other area as far as I could tell with my testing and stuff like that. So, but anyways, it's got 4K 120 like we talked about. Now, another cool thing about the introduction of 4K 120 is it also gave us HD 240. So if you're using S and Q mode, you can get 10 times slow motion if you're recording in uh, 240 frames per second and you have the timeline, you know, the, the output set to 24 frames per second. So that's 10 times slow motion at 1080, which is pretty awesome uh, in my opinion. So that's a nice upgrade. This camera really did get a lot of upgrades. Um, I'm kind of surprised they kept the price the same. Um, but like I said, I was also hoping for a camera that wouldn't overheat. So it's kind of like this love, hate. Of course, I want a better viewfinder also. You know, there's always these things, a better screen. You know, there's always going to be something, you know. Um, so I already talked about the viewfinder being brighter. Oh, another thing this has is uh, focus breathing compensation. That is an awesome feature uh, for video users. Only certain lenses have that uh, built in, you know, the focus breathing comp. Like the camera has to have like the programming in there. Um, so that's a really cool feature um, that the A6700 offers. Uh, let's see. Go back to the camera one. All right. Sorry, I forgot to switch the camera again like an idiot. Um, all right. So it has the AI processing unit I already talked about. Um, so the AI processing unit, it apparently gives it 20% better, more accurate uh, auto exposure. Uh, when shooting so like if you're in rapid fire mode, it's auto exposing in between every single frame and Sony's claiming that it got 20% better Because of the AI chip. So I guess it could just process more data. I don't know um, but that's cool and uh, in addition to the um, AI processing um, you also have the auto framing feature now This has the auto framing feature, which is cool um, but it doesn't have cine vlog so cine vlog is another cool feature that has come with the newer Sony cameras, but it only comes with the Sony cameras. I'm speculating with the Z in the model number. So like the ZV-1, the ZV-E1, uh, for example, have cine vlog. This camera does not, but it has pretty much all the other features, which is kind of weird, you know? So it's, again, it's like separating the photo cameras to the video cameras type of thing, it seems like. Uh, so that's worth noting. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, the Wi-Fi, it's got 5G now instead of just 2.4, so that's another upgrade. Let's see, what else? Um, the battery is pretty much the same. Uh, well, it is the same. Battery life is about the same. It's got the same magnesium alloy body, which is nice. Very good weather sealing and, and dust moisture resistant is, is pretty good on the doors. It's not like rubber gasketed on the doors, um, but it does have, oh, no, it does have like a little bit of a a rubber there. Let me switch this so you can see this. I didn't notice it. You see that little bit of like rubber there? That is a rubber gasket. That's pretty cool. I didn't notice that. I apologize. I wonder if it has that on the other doors. Um, not so much on the other doors, but still, that's pretty cool. Uh, what else we got? The grip I already talked about. Oh yeah, bracketing. I use bracketing a lot for HDR photography. So they changed that in the camera here. Let me just show you. Let me switch to this and zoom in. I, I am very comfortable, I, or I'm so used to using bracketing because I take HDR photos all the time. 
So if you want to go to bracketing, if you go into drive modes here, oh, this is the new interface, by the way, this touch interface. You can like swipe to get rid of this stuff if you want. Well, the stuff on the sides, it depends on what mode you're in. Uh, and you can get rid of this on the bottom if you want on the menu. But if you go to the drive modes here and scroll down, uh, this is where bracketing is. And it just looks different. Now it says uh, bracket continuous. It used to have like little arrows left and right that you would have to hit to change it. Now they have it set up kind of like ISO is where it's two separate boxes and you can go up and down. So I, this is much better and it's easier to see and like visualize and like what you're doing. It just makes more sense to me. So I really like this upgrade uh, in the menu system there as far as just bracketing goes because I use that feature all the time. Um, pretty much everything else I noticed was very similar to the ZV-E1 and the ZV-1 Mark II and the A6600. It's pretty much the same um, otherwise uh, for all intensive purposes. The stabilization, um, the stabilization did not upgrade on this either so the it's still five stops stab i was hoping for an upgrade there but again 7000 series uh hopefully it comes with that um also i just wanted to show you guys this cool strap that i got um from Falcam. it's really nice look at this thing it's like padded and and leather and it's got this like magnet here where you can just like pull it off so you can just take the strap off super easy i really really like this strap and I, it comes with two sets of these. So I have this on my other camera as well, and I can just take this strap and move it from camera to camera. I thought that was pretty cool. So just in case you guys were wondering about this strap uh, sitting here on the camera, that's what the deal is with that. So we're looking good. We're back to me on the screen. All right, let's go over some of these comments. Let me bring up, um, oh guys, by the way, can you do me a favor and give me a thumbs up? I really appreciate if you give me a thumbs up, thanks. Um, it helps out. So let me just open up Ecamm here. Just bear with me a second here because uh, I suck at Ecamm. <laughs> I'm still not good at all. Like I, the windows disappear. It's like I'm getting the hang of it, but I don't use it enough. You know what I mean? So let's see here. I'm just trying to bring up the comments. Just give me one second, please. Oh, Chris. All right. So if I double click it, is that how I do it? Hang on. There we go. All right, Chris Deflex. Uh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, you giving me that feedback there about the audio and stuff. Um, I wish I could just double click these. Just got to drag them out. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, what do we got here? Yeah, there's got to be an easier way to bring the comments out so it doesn't. Uh, so it lines up better each time. But anyways, um, all right, first question we got going here. I have the A6500 and an A7 III. Besides a new battery and the UHS-2 SD card slot, the only major difference I see for me is the built-in time-lapse function. Is that correct? Yeah, so the built-in time-lapse is another feature that's pretty awesome in there. That is definitely an upgrade. Um, the UHS-2 is an upgrade uh, as well. You're correct. Um, the autofocus technology uh, has improved a decent amount since the A6500. So we're like two generations beyond. With that being said, the A6500 and the A7 III autofocus is really good, but it's it's like two generations like old now. You know what I mean? It still works great, but it's not quite as good. Um, in addition to that, you're getting like a lot more software features like the time-lapse that you mentioned. So that might not matter to you, but there's like a lot of software and stuff built into these newer cameras that you may or may not want, you know? So you need to factor that in as well. If you're not using any of that software stuff, then I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't upgrade um, if I were you, just, just my opinion. All right, let me get rid of this here. Thank you, Lewis, I appreciate that. Oh, what's up, Mark? Mark's here. I'm glad it's cheaper without the stack sensor because I have to buy it. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, if you got to buy it, then it's better. But come on, stack sensor, dude. We need it. We need an APS-C stack sensor camera. Like Sony's forcing us, I feel like, to buy full frame. You got to get like the A9 or something if you want that, you know, like, and I understand why they're doing it. They want you to buy the better cameras and then the, the better, more expensive lenses as well. It makes sense, you know. Um, but yeah, I hear you. Uh, 
I honestly am still surprised it's the same price. I figured they'd raise it at least a hundred or two with the newer, you know, technology they have in there, but I guess not. All right, what do we got here? All right. Valentine. Uh, hopefully I'm saying that name correctly. Sony said this is not their flagship camera. That means there will be another one with a stack sensor or 40 megapixel, uh, one with a different body. I hope you're right. I think you're right as well because, like I said, the next seven, there's another series above the 6000 series, and they haven't come out with one since the next seven. So I agree with you. I, they they got to come out with one. Uh, will it have a stack sensor? I don't know because the A7R5 doesn't have a stack sensor. You know, so it doesn't have to have that, but it does have to have a fast readout speed or else we're going to get rolling shutter, and that sucks. So we really do need um, that fast uh, readout speed. A 40, <laughs> yeah, a 40 megapixel stack sensor would be awesome. That, that Fuji XHS, I think it is, Sony makes the sensors for Fuji. So that sensor that's in the Fuji, they could just throw in their next camera, you know? Like, so uh, I'm not sure what the resolution is on that Fuji, though. I can't remember off the top of my head. All right, what do we got here? Uh, Luann Williams. I would like Sony to add an, inter, an internal intervalometer where you can set the shutter speed beyond 30 seconds. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so there are built-in intervalometers in these, but it, you can't set it to more than 30 seconds, which sucks. Um, it's great having the intervalometer feature, which is cool, but that is a limitation for sure. That's a good point. Um, hopefully Sony's watching this. That, that's a good point. Hey, David, how you doing? Um, yes, I will be doing a complete user guide for the A6700. I'm going to do like the standard beginner's guide. So I'll go over it how I do in my beginner's guides. I, hopefully that works for you. Um, it might be a little too simplistic for some people, but I like just that baseline on my YouTube channel. Because a lot of people I notice over the years, they, you, I know it's hard to believe, but some people, when they look into this uh, stuff, you know, they, they actually can afford cameras like this. So when they start looking around, they just, they automatically, like they, they spent a thousand dollars on their phone. They're not really, so spending this much on a camera isn't that shocking, you know, to, it is for new users because, you know, a lot of us save a long time to get a camera like this, but you'd be surprised. All, all I'm trying to say is you would be shocked at how many people buy really good cameras and they've never used a camera before. I see it in the comments on my videos all the time. And people are like, they're like, why are you making a beginner's guide for this camera? It makes no sense. I'm like, yeah, well, I understand from your perspective it doesn't, but there are new users that come in. So anyways, uh, yes, the A6700 beginner's guide will be coming out fairly soon, probably like realistically like a week or two from now because um, I have another video I need to record tomorrow first. So, but yeah, stay tuned for that. Coming soon. All right, let's see. Wow, I have no idea how to pronounce this guy's name or this person's name. Uh, I'm just going to call you Owl. <laughs> um, hey, Jason. Here. Oh, Rudy. There we go. Hey, Rudy. Uh, from the Netherlands. Oh, Netherlands. That's cool, man. I'm a big fan of your videos. Thank you. I pre-ordered the A6700. Does this camera also have dual native ISO? It's the same sensor as the FX30. Uh, yes, it does have the dual... Well... <laughs> no, it doesn't as far as the camera recognizing it as a dual base. The camera doesn't recognize it as a dual base, but yes, it's the same sensor. So it has the same like base ISOs. So uh, if you're using flexible ISO and log or whatever, you can use that higher base um, the same as the FX30. Yes, but it's not in the it's not like in the menu as a hard set second dual base like it is on the FX30, I believe. I think it shows it on the FX30, like so it's like obvious. Um, but yeah, it does it does have that because it's the same sensor. But like I said, it's not like in the menu. It's not in there like visibly uh, noticeable. Photo camera first, I think, is what the lesson we need to uh, remember here. Uh, Davin, what's up? I have the Sony A6300. Should I upgrade? Ooh. All right, now you are on, you're like really on the threshold of upgrading because the A6300 doesn't have any IBIS in it, so there's no sensor stabe. And it has the older, smaller battery, which really sucks. That battery life is horrible. Uh, so 
it's a tough call. I mean, it's a lot of money. Uh, I would consider it. I mean, I would consider it if you're stuck on the crop factor body. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a tough call. I mean, it, it is. this is definitely a worthy upgrade from the A6300. Um, the A6500 and the A6400 are closer. But yeah, 6300, you don't really need to. The image quality is going to be really close as far as photos go. It's not going to be much better. Uh, as far as like looking at the images on your computer and stuff, but the autofocus is far superior. Um, and they did add a lot of stuff on the body, like the ergonomics, the dials and things like that are much better. The grip is much better. So uh, if you got the money and you're ready to upgrade, I mean, it's it's probably worth upgrading, I would say. I mean, I don't want to tell people to upgrade, but uh, I would consider it if I were in your shoes. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, all right. These comments are like coming out of surprise because I didn't have time to like read them in advance. So I'm just reading them uh, as I go here. I should clarify that I shoot stills and not video with my gear. Oh, all right. Which question were you? Uh, oh, Luann. Okay, yeah. That makes sense. I understand. Yeah, you, you want that intervalometer built in. I, I agree. I, Sony should definitely do that. I don't know why that... I don't know why they haven't. I'll bring it up uh, next time um, in a situation where somebody might be listening. I'll mention that. Let me write that down, actually. That just seems like a software upgrade that they could do. Let me just write that down. Interferometer uh, uh, feature with more than 30 seconds. At the very least, maybe I'll get an answer if there's some kind of weird limitation or something that I'm not thinking of. I don't know. All right, so what do we got here? Uh, where was I? Oh, living with Grace in Japan. Wow, what a cool name. Uh, I worked for Canon and Nikon, but my favorite is Sony. <laughs> That's cool. Interesting. Cool comment. Fascinating. Canon's catching up, and so is Nikon, though. They really are. These newer cameras are really good. Uh, purely photo, any difference in image quality than the A66, A64, A61? Uh, no, not really. The No. It, it, it's like the autofocus points changed. Uh, I think it's at the A6300. So the A6300 has more phase detection autofocus points. But other than that, it's the same sensor, like as far as the image quality goes. Now, Sony does claim that they changed their color algorithm. So the colors in the A6600 are different than the A6100. Um, it's really not that much though, but you can notice it in the skin tones a little bit. So there is a little bit of a difference there, but if you're shooting raw and you're using proper white balance, it's not that much of a difference. Basically, it's the same. Um, it's not like the ISO or the lower light is way better or anything like that. It's all basically identical. All right, what do we got here? Oh, by the way, guys, if you asked a question and you have another question, just keep firing away. All right, so what do we got? Living, uh, David. All right, here we go. David Maltese. I wonder if the sensor is trimmed down version of the A7R5. It equates to this. Yeah, I think it is. I think that's exactly what it is. I think it's actually... Yeah, the A7R5, A7R4 is like the same sensor. I think it's it comes from the A7R4 uh, sensor. It's just a smaller die. So instead of building it out to full frame, but I believe it's the A7 4 the A7R4, sorry, the A7R4 uh, sensor die, I believe is what they use to make the FX30 uh, and this A6700 um, sensor. So I, I think you're correct, David. I didn't realize Sony did that until recently. Uh, a couple months back, maybe like a year ago, I learned that they use the same die. Uh, as long as the resolution pixel density is the same, you could just use the same die and make it bigger or smaller depending on the sensor size, which is pretty cool. So they probably do the same thing with cell phone sensors and all sorts of stuff. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, I meant the A7R4 when I said that, uh, Valentin. I apologize, that was my mistake. I keep saying A7 IV instead of A7 R4. All right. I forgot to get a drink. I'm kind of thirsty. 
I might have to go grab a drink quick. All right, let's see here. Mark, what's up, Mark? He's back. What do you got? I got the same overheating numbers as Gerald. No overheating in 4K24 or 4K6. Wow, really none? Ran until the battery ran out. 4K120. How could 4K60 run until the battery runs out and 4K120 overheat in 20 minutes? Like, that doesn't even make sense to me. If it takes 20 minutes for 4K120, at the very least, you would think, logically, in my brain anyways, around 40 minute mark, 4K60 should overheat. Maybe a little longer. But that's interesting, dude. I, I appreciate you sharing your results. That's actually good news, what you reported, because uh, Gerald obviously does, he's one of the best testers on YouTube. So I took his numbers as, like, you know, gospel. But then Jordan from uh, Petapixel, you know, the old DP Review guys, um, you know, he got way less, you know, numbers than Gerald did. So uh, we'll get to the bottom of it. But that's good to know, Mark. Uh, I'm glad you reported that because... I was going to test this myself before I review it, but so many people tested it. I figured I would get similar results to uh, what you got, except for the 4K60. That's fascinating. I did expect 4K120 to overheat in like 15, though. All right, cool. What do we got here? John? Hey, John. Uh, when shooting with the electronic shutter, can a sound be added to indicate an exposure? My AI has that but the a7r5 does not oh your a1 has that i don't know i do not know off the top of my head it's a good question i couldn't tell you i'm sorry i'm not i'm just not aware uh that would be like in the menu area under what sounds and stuff are muted um i don't know i don't have the camera on me so i can't say for sure um i'll look at that though on the a6700 and see if it's a feature on this camera because if it is then it probably is on the a7 R5, but if you can't find it, uh, yeah, no, actually, it's probably just something they keep with the flagship model, uh, now that I think about it. If your A7R5 doesn't have it, I highly doubt this camera will. Uh, yeah, I hear you uh, as far as a visual cue goes. I, I was talking to a friend of mine about this, and I don't like I don't like silent mode because I like to know when the camera focuses, and I like to know when it actually takes the shot. When you have it in silent mode, like you have no idea that you took thirty shots if it's in rapid fire mode. So I hear what you're saying. You know, um, I don't know. I would rather just use mechanical or leave the audio stuff on and just deal with the beeping as much as it might suck. Uh, just turn it on and off as needed, maybe. Uh, Chris the Flex. What's up, Chris? You're back. I live in South Florida where it's extremely hot, and I will be using the Sony ZV-1 outdoors tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it overheats. Yep. Uh, 4K, uh, 24, that's a very small camera body. And if you're in direct sunlight, yeah, it's going to overheat on you. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head how long you'll be able to get with that. But, um, you know... Try to put it in the shade, you know, try to keep it cool if possible. Um, at least get it out of the sun for a while before you hit record so it cools down a little bit. Because the metal, the metal body like heats up if it's in direct sunlight, you know. So maybe keep it in a little bag um, so it's a little cooler. I mean, you don't want it ice cold because then it'll fog up when you take it out. But uh, you should be able to get some decent recording times. Worst case, switch it to HD and you'll get way longer recording times. Not as good as 4K, but, you know, you got to work with what you have, you know. All right. How fast is uh, Valentine with another one? How fast is connecting to a mobile phone or to a PC to transfer files or tether shooting? Um, it's pretty quick, actually. You just have to you have to install the Creators app on the uh, camera, the new Creators app. It's actually you don't have to install it. I'm sorry. You need the new Creators app on your smart device. Um, that's what the the newer Sony cameras use. And once you have that set up, I have a video on that. Um, I could drop a link. I'll get that link for you in a minute. Um, but you basically have to connect the camera to your smart device through the new creators app. And once they're like paired together, it's fairly easy to connect them. Now, as far as how long it takes to transfer photos, it depends on your wireless network really, you know? So if your phone's 5G and the camera's 5G, it'll definitely transfer faster, but it still takes a while. 
Um, I actually, I don't really like using it that way. Um, I like plugging the memory card directly into my computer, or I like plugging a cable into the camera and plugging that into my computer, and then like extracting the photos that way. Um, because it's just, it's too slow using the app. And I don't really want all the high resolution images on my phone either. Now, I know some people like to edit on their phone and their iPad, and for those people, like, you might want to do that. So I get it. Um, but honestly, though, if you're using Apple stuff, I would still drag the photos onto my computer, and I would just airdrop them onto whatever device I wanted. And that I think that method would be way faster, and you wouldn't have to, you know, fill up your mobile device either. So um, as far as Tethered goes, Tethered's really easy. You can use a USB-C cable. And if you install the Imaging Edge desktop app, um, you could then tether with that app to your uh, camera via the USB-C cable. And that's really easy to use. I have a video on that as well. Um, it's a little bit older of a video, but the, that program still looks to be the same pretty much. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not that hard and it's pretty quick uh, to do. So hopefully that answered your question. It's just the initial setup that's kind of a pain in the ass with the, with the app. But it's really not that bad if you if you watch the video. Um, I'll get that video for you in a second. Uh, all right, John says true. Valentine. Uh, Snow Owl 156 is his name. Oh, okay, you must be friends with him. All right, Roy, what do you got here? Can you reassign record? Uh, can you reassign the record button in photo mode? Uh, I don't know. Good question. Hang on, let me find out. Actually, you guys want to watch? All right, if you go in here, operation customize, we want to customize for photo. So if we go in there, let's go to the top of the camera. Movie record button. Yeah, you can change it. Movie shooting, you can change the movie record button in photo mode, yep. That's cool. Uh, thanks for asking that question. So, yes. What's up, doctor? Uh, don't wanna say your name wrong. I'll just say doctor. Better audio recommendation for videos like yours because it's great, or whatever, stars. Well, so what I'm using for video, uh, I'm recording right now with the Sony a7C. I have the uh, Hot Shoe um, KLR adapter. I can't remember what the name of it is. KLR something or other. And I'm using up top here. If you look in the video description, uh, I have the microphones I'm using. This one that I'm using right now during this live stream is the Sennheiser MKE 600. It's awesome. Uh, it's a few hundred dollars. I think it's like 250 maybe. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But I'm using that, and it's an XLR mic that requires phantom power. So I have a cable going into the top of the uh, KLR unit that's on my A7C, and that XLR cable plugs right into it. And that's where the really good audio is coming from. And because it goes right into the camera, it's so easy to do what we're doing here as far as live streaming goes. Uh, and also when I'm recording videos, I don't have to worry about syncing the audio up after the fact because what I was using was this for the longest time uh, I was using this guy here Damn, I keep forgetting to switch the camera back. Oh, no, it's back um, Yeah, what I was using was this so I had the microphone originally plugged into this XLR and then this takes a memory card and after I recorded the videos I had to sync up the audio with my video and that was just a pain in the butt you know i got so tired of doing that but I, it wasn't that bad but you have to sync it up after the fact and it's a che it's cheaper than buying the klr unit and stuff like that so um but that's how i do it and that really is probably the easiest turnkey and best way to do it because it just embeds the quality audio right to your video and you don't have to do any syncing in post so that's what i recommend also um the other mic that i really like is this guy this is the uh let me switch cameras again this is the sennheiser mke 400 and this is fantastic this mic is really good it goes right on top of the camera and it's fairly compact and small you can see here 
it's it's a really good quality unit uh very very good quality audio so this is what i use when i'm out in the field and stuff and i really like that uh solution for just on top of the camera turnkey um, i have another mic but it doesn't sound near as good this is the rode video micro let me cover my face this guy here yeah this is the rode video micro and it's not a bad mic it's a it's a pretty decent mic uh, it's very affordable, um, and it's very small and compact, as you could see, this little, like, puffball here. But the audio is not near as good as the Sennheiser. It's, like, night and day difference. So, well, my fan just fell over. All right. Uh, hopefully that helped you out. If you have more questions, by all means. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think so. I think they got rid of that. Yeah, there's no NFC symbol on it. I don't. I don't think it has that. Um, I'm pretty. I don't think it does. I, I didn't. I, when I was reading through the specs, it didn't advertise that, and it used to. Um, so that's a good question. I, I didn't even think of it until you brought it up. But I don't think it does because all the other ones have an NFC on the side. Could be wrong about that. Oh, it's the owl dude. Um, in the Netherlands, the price is 1,700 euro. Ooh, much more expensive than the USA. I always wonder where that big difference comes from. I think it comes from that VAT tax you guys have over there. We don't have that in, in uh, the United States. Pretty sure that's what it is. That adds like 15% or whatever it is onto like everything electronic maybe, or maybe it's just cameras. I'm not sure, but I th that might be the reason. I don't know. I'm speculating here. Why is the ZV-E10 so expensive? Uh, I don't think it's expensive at all. It's very cheap for what you get, in my opinion. Maybe you mean the ZV-E1? Uh, that is pretty expensive. The reason that's so expensive is because it has that unbelievable, awesome sensor that the FX3 has. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it's so expensive, if that's what you're asking. Sorry, Anthony. The, the uh, ZV-E10 is really affordable, in my opinion, so I don't think that's expensive at all. Um, if that's what you meant. Yeah, A7R4. Thanks, I'm just catching up to that. Oh, someone's bagging me, uh, spamming my channel. How do I get rid of this guy? I don't know how to get rid of him. Oh, well. Uh, ignore the horrible comments if you see any. I'm not sure if they popped up. It looks like they, it looks like they might have been screened out a little bit. I'm not sure. Just looking at these comments here. Yeah, no, VVE 10. Interesting. All right. Uh, hey, what's up? What's the best Sony camera for beginners? That's a really good question. Uh, it just it honestly depends on what you're doing, how much money you want to spend, how much you plan on getting into it. Um, I would probably start with something with a, it also depends on if you're doing photos or videos. If you're doing photos, um, I really like the viewfinder, the electronic viewfinder. And that's something you need to consider because um, when you're outside in the bright conditions, if you're just looking at a screen, like on the ZV-E10, for example, which is a really good camera I would recommend, that does not have a viewfinder though. So if you're outside trying to take photos in the sun, you're not going to be happy, in my opinion, because you can't see the screen and you really need a viewfinder. So if you're, if, it depends on what you're doing, but I would probably consider something for a beginner, maybe get a used, um, like a used A6400. If you want stabilization, you can get an A6600, something like that. Uh, if you want something small, you could get, you know, like the original ZV-1, um, again, no viewfinder. Uh, it's fairly easy camera to use, um, the ZV series cameras. They're, they're very easy to use. They, the way that they're designed, they're really kind of made for beginners, but they're more video oriented. So if you're looking for more photos, that's why I would consider more like the A6400. Um, that does not have sensor stabilization though, but you can find a used one for a pretty good price. And that's an excellent camera, in my opinion, for beginners. Um, you can go cheaper than that though. The A6100, find a used one of those. That's another great option for a beginner. 
Um, it's just more plastic on the body and stuff. So it just depends on your budget and, and things like that. Um, but that's probably what I would recommend for a beginner um, to the Sony system. You know, I, I wouldn't recommend necessarily going full frame. The camera is so much bigger and heavier and same with the lenses. It might be too much of a burden uh, going right to full frame. You might be like, this is ridiculous carrying this around, you know. So I would tend to go with a smaller camera first. Something like the ZV-1, maybe even the RX100 series cameras, but those are expensive. So, I don't know, the ZV-E10 and the ZV-1 and the A6400 or the A63, A6100, somewhere around there would probably be a good place to, to start looking. Um, definitely look for used stuff. You can save a lot of money. Uh, All right, what else we got? Hang on a second here. I'm just looking at the comments. Hey, John. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad, dude. Uh, when you when you use like a really high quality electronic viewfinder, like something on the A7R5, for example, or you know a really higher end Sony camera, the resolution is so much higher. It's like nine million megapixel versus two. And it's way larger also, so it, it's a night and day difference. It looks way better. Um, the screen also is pretty crappy. Um, what I find, especially coming, now that I started reviewing Canon and Nikon cameras also, um, I really noticed it more because the Canon and Nikon screens are way better. Same thing with the uh, Panasonic screens. They're so much better, you notice it as soon as you turn the camera on. The screen looks like an iPhone screen. You're like, wow, like your picture, everything looks so much better. Uh, just like Jared says, when you get on the computer, everything looks great. It really does. But on the screen, it doesn't look as good. Same thing with the viewfinder. Like it, it doesn't look as good. Like it looks like the pictures you're taking aren't quite as good. And it's a little bit disheartening when you're taking the pictures and looking at them on the screen. And that's what he's referring to. And it is true. Um, they're not garbage. I wouldn't say garbage, but compared to like a, a higher end uh, model, definitely not as good. Um, the Canon screens are far superior. The Canon electronic viewfinders on the cheaper cameras are pretty crappy too, but like the viewfinder on like the R5 or the R3 is incredible. So kind of comes with price points, but I'd still want the viewfinder then not have it. So I'll still take a, a crappy one, then no viewfinder. Um, that's kind of how I look at it. Oh, thanks Josh. What's up Josh? Nice to see you, buddy. Yeah, make sure you check out Josh's channel. He's a really, really good uh, YouTuber. I wonder, this guy is spamming my channel and I have no idea how to stop it from happening. Oh well. Uh, oh, okay. That's interesting. That kind of does make sense because of the 5G. So you probably can transfer it quite a bit faster. Um, and those are huge files. So that's good to know. It does make sense. I could see it being faster with the 5G. Um, and like I said, that's just my workflow. I like to go to the computer. I, I, it's just my personal thing. So uh, I'm not telling you to do that. I, I get it. People want to um, just transfer wirelessly. I get. You don't want to use cables. You don't want to take the memory card out. I totally get it. Um, it's just not as good as you would think. Like it, it just doesn't work as good as I would like it to. Um, all right. What else we got here? Jess. Uh, I don't even know what that means. Just found this broadcast. It was being recorded. Uh, oh yeah. I gotcha. I gotcha. I gotcha. All right. Yeah. So I'll leave the live stream up for a bit. I leave, I usually leave them up for a couple of days at least to give people a chance to watch it. It depends on how good the live stream is. Uh, I'm getting a little bit better at it, so I might leave this one up longer. I don't know. They're just not as good as like a polished edited video though. You know what I mean? So I tend to not leave them up, but I don't know. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, to be honest with you. Let me know in the comments. Should I leave the live streams up? I'd like your guys' opinion on it because they're definitely not as good as like a polished video. You know what I mean? Uh, and I just don't see that many people wanting to watch me babble for an hour. Um, it's different because I'm interacting with you guys. So it makes sense when you're here live. But after the fact, uh, I don't know. I kind of like, I wonder, you know, myself. So 
All right, looks like we're getting some answers here from Greg. Uh, Europe tax is 19 to 20% higher for all goods, basically. Only a few exceptions. Wow, dude. Yes, yeah, so you guys just have 20% more. You got to cough up. Sorry about that. That sucks. Uh, is the A6700 good for running gun work? Yeah, I would say so, as long as you're not recording for a long period of time in hot conditions. Um, if you're like anywhere from like 75 degrees and lower, uh, absolutely, I would say it's a good option. Um, a great option even. But for run and gun, thinking short form. So you're running, you're recording short clips, you're running around photos, this, that, and the other. Absolutely, I think it would be good for that. But the overheating is a serious concern though if you're doing anything long form or if you're doing anything where it's really hot out. So you have to factor that in. But for almost pretty much everything, yeah, I would say so. Um, I don't think I would have a problem using this and overheating. Like, I, the, for example, the A7 IV overheats. If you record in 4K60 on the A7 IV for too long, it overheats. And in the real world, I never had a problem with it. I've recorded long form. I've recorded uh, not too long with 4K60, but in the field, you know, trying to track birds and stuff. And in those, in those scenarios, I never had a problem. But long form stuff, it, the cameras overheat. So... You gotta, you gotta remember that. But for uh, run and gun, like I'm thinking quick and fast type stuff, I think this would be a great option for that. Uh, A6700 or keep, uh, oh, keep A7. Uh, I think you're having a hard time. Okay. All right, so that's a good question. Now, I have the a7 IV, and I love the a7 IV. My beef with the a7 IV, though, is the rolling shutter. This used to not be a problem. It never bothered me because I was pretty much exclusively doing photo type stuff. Um, but when I started doing more video stuff and like walking around with the a7 IV, I wanted to kind of use it and like talk to the camera and stuff. Like, And I noticed that the rolling shutter is so bad that when you try to stabilize the footage in post, that jello effect, you can't stabilize it. It just looks like garbage if you try to stabilize uh, shaky footage because of the rolling shutter. So that's my biggest beef with the a7 IV. Other than that though, I absolutely love the camera. So that's a tough call. If you're not doing video and you don't care about rolling shutter, I would probably go with the a7 IV because the full frame sensor is definitely better. Um, it's, it's just better. So, and the viewfinder on the, on the a7 IV is a little bit better as well. Uh, it's noticeably better than this viewfinder on the a6700. The a7 IV has dual slots. You probably know all this already, but, uh, that's a tough call. You know, there, there are enough crop factor lenses now that are high quality where you can go crop factor and get really good lenses. Um, so you don't have to use full frame lenses on crop factor bodies to get good optics. So you can get away with the A6700 if, uh, and, and also have options as far as really good lenses go. So that's a tough call. It really is. It depends on your budget because the A7 IV is like $1,000 more. So it's hard to say if it's worth $1,000 more to you. Um, to me, it would be for the full frame sensor. I would rather have the A7 IV. But like I said, I, that rolling shutter is kind of bothering me these days. So uh, it just is what it is. That that's my uh, feedback. I hope that helps you. All right, what do we got here? I'm in a bit. I'm in. Uh, all right, I'm a bit in doubt now, to be honest, because of the overheating issue with the A6700. I mostly use my camera for filming. Is the FX30 for that reason? Maybe yes, hundred percent. The FX30 is the camera to get for video because it has active cooling. It has a built-in fan, so that will not overheat. It's just not going to overheat. Like you could be out in direct sunlight, not going to overheat. So yeah, the FX30, 100% is better for film. Now, the, well, like well, arguably one downside uh, from my perspective might be that it doesn't have a viewfinder, right? Well, you can get like an aftermarket monitor for that and just like use the HDMI out to a, like a monitor and you could use a monitor because that's like a video camera, you know? So it just depends on what you're doing. But yeah, the FX30 would be the one to go with 100% um, because it won't overheat. It's optimized for video. And it's just a better camera uh, for video, like across the board. So yeah, FX30 all the way uh, if you're doing video, I would say. Uh, 
Hi, I have a question. Uh, if I want to use a pocket cam, which used to be in the range of old 16 megapixel cyber shots, which one would you advise? A pocket camera? Well, probably, hmm. It depends on how much power you want, really, and how much money you want to spend. Because, dude, the RX100 Mark Seven is probably still today one of the best pocketable cameras ever made. It's like the size of a deck of cards. It's got a 24 to 200 millimeter zoom lens, and that collapses down to like nothing. So you can put it in your pocket. Um, so that versatility of the 24 to 200 is insane for a camera that could fit in your pocket. You got to, especially if you're like going to a concert, you know, they don't let you bring professional equipment into concerts. You know, if you come in with a real camera, they're like, where are you going, buddy? You know, but if you have this thing in your pocket, they're like, they're like, oh, that's just a, that's just a point and shoot. God, come on in, come on in. You know, so from that perspective, I would say the RX100 Mark VII is probably the best pocketable camera, um, but it's very expensive. So it has a lot of power, very expensive. Battery life also isn't very good. So a more affordable version of that would be the Sony ZV-1. That's also pocketable, about the same size form factor, a little bit easier to use the ZV-1. It's way cheaper, way less money. It's got the same sensor though, and it's got a really awesome Zeiss optic on it as well. So you're gonna get really good quality photos and videos, um, and it's small, cheap, so. Sony ZV-1 probably would be my recommendation uh, for the best money to power. Um, the But the best option is the RX100 Mark 7, I would say, uh, for the maximum power um, in a pocketable camera. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I really do. Thank you. It means a lot. I kind of like doing these live streams. Uh, they're sort of fun. I'm, I'm kind of starting to get the hang of it. It's like a little nerve wracking. Um, but you guys are asking great questions. All right, I'll leave it up. That's the, you're not the first one. So I'll leave the live stream up for a bit. I, I appreciate your feedback on that. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate that perspective. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, it's the content that matters, not the quality. That's fair, dude. A lot of great YouTubers don't have the greatest production quality and their content crushes and they do great work. You know, I watch videos all the time, like trying to figure something out, uh, you know, fixing my dirt bike or whatever. And like the, <laughs> so I, I hear you, dude. It's the content. I get it. Uh, I appreciate that sediment there. Yeah, you can upload LUTs into the A6700. Uh, as far as how many you can put in there, I don't know. Uh, I'll have to figure that out when I'm doing the beginner's guide. I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. I also don't know if you can use those LUTs for photos. I don't know. Uh, I'd have to test that. You might be able to. Um, not sure. I'll have to check that again with, when I do the beginner's guide. I apologize, I don't have that answer. All right, what else am I missing here? Da, 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 da. photos da, da, da. all right this guy thank you so much i appreciate it i really appreciate that thank you uh read down our vertical words here okay not really sure what you mean by the red arrow stuff but uh i guess ask questions maybe all right chris the flex is back what do you got bud I had that problem with the ZV-1 while outdoor. The viewing the screen was impossible to see. I ordered the tempered glass screen protector. It fixed the problem. What? How did the tempered glass make your screen brighter? Interesting. Well, one thing you can do to make your screen brighter, if you guys don't know, let me show you. Pretty much all the Sony cameras have this. If you go into the uh, menu, you go down to like the suitcase area is usually where it is. And you gotta look for a monitor, 
where is it? Here it is, monitor brightness. So find the monitor brightness on your camera. And right now I have it set to sunny weather. So by default, it is set to manual. And you can see how much darker this looks. It's way darker. But I was outside earlier using the screen and I'm like, uh, it's too dark. So I went in here and I switched it to sunny weather and boom, the screen gets way brighter. So pretty much all the Sony cameras have that option to switch it to sunny weather. Highly recommend doing that. It'll help a lot, especially if you don't have a viewfinder. If you have a viewfinder, you don't really need to change it, but I still do. Cause I, when I'm doing horizontal shots like this, I, it's kind of hard to use the viewfinder uh, for horizontals or verticals. What am I saying? Um, so for that, I like using the screen and I flip the screen out like this. So I hold it like that. And I just look down at the screen, like as I'm shooting. And that's how I like to do vertical. Um, when I'm doing horizontal, I use the electronic viewfinder and I love how the viewfinder is off to the left. I know some people might not like that, but when I do it, my nose now does not hit the screen when I put my eye up. So I much prefer the viewfinder on the side, even though it might seem odd because in you know, almost all the other cameras, it's in the center, you know what I mean? But I actually like that. I'm one of the few people that does like, apparently, but I think it's great. Uh, I'd love to know how that tempered glass made your screen brighter, Chris. All right, uh, what do we got here? All right, uh, any info about the uh, battery grip? No, I haven't heard anything about that. Uh, for the a6700 the battery life's really good on this camera though. You can get like 570 shots approximately like that's really good uh, like an uh, Probably like an hour and a half of recording on one battery plus don't forget you can get a PD power source Let me let me show you what I got. Hang on Fix my fan it's kind of hot in here So let me switch cameras and show you this. So when you're looking for these things, see how it says PD right there? That means this thing can pump out enough power that it classifies as it having PD power. Um, so you can just plug in a USB-C cable to this and then plug it into your camera and your camera will run off the PD power. So that's kind of the solution to battery life. See, so it depends on what you're doing. Again, like if you're, taking, if you're outside and you're taking sports or something, then you're going to need multiple batteries. This isn't practical for that, but uh, don't know about a battery grip yet. Um, how does it compare to the A6300, the A6700? Well, um, it's very similar, but it has a new sensor and it has a new autofocus system. So those are like uh, two generations newer, so that's better. Um, it has the larger, better battery. Um, it's got a significantly larger camera body. Not, it's actually not significantly larger. It's a little bit larger camera body. Uh, it's got the flippy screen on the back for selfie footage, which is really nice if you need to be in front of the camera. Uh, it's got a lot of upgrades from the A6300. Um, trying to think what else. Frames per second is probably higher. The, oh, sensor stabilization. The sensor stab is huge. Uh, the memory card being on the side instead of in where the battery is. And, you know, the, the, the bigger battery and bigger grip is, is uh, that alone, honestly, is almost worth upgrading just to having that much bigger battery. Um, the guy earlier was asking about that as well, and I didn't factor in the larger battery. Um, that should weigh heavier into your decision, in my opinion, because... The smaller batteries really suck. The these little ones, they just don't last that long. The MP uh, FW fifties or whatever. So the Z one hundreds last so much longer. So that's uh, what I have to say about that. I got you. Um, someone's asking me to do a backflip. Interesting. It looks like YouTube's weeding out some of these bad comments. All right, Valentin, uh, do the review. Can you please tell me how many shots you can get with one battery only for photo? Yeah, like I, I already answered this. You probably heard it. It's like 550 approximately photos you can get off one battery.
All right, what do we got here? The greatest feature on the A6700, in my opinion, is the reframing possibility in a fixed shot. I've never seen this in any other camera. Have you used it in practice? Is it as good as they say it is? All right, so the auto framing feature is super cool. Yes, I used it. If you check out my Sony ZV-E1 video, um, I show it off in that video uh, um, quite a bit. I show it off, I think, twice. Also, the ZV-1 Mark II video, uh, I showed it in that video as well. Um, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It, it does work. Um, it kind of crops in on you and like follows you around the frame, you know? So because this has a higher resolution sensor than the ZV-E1, I think it's going to actually work better than on the ZV-E1 because that that camera sensor is only 12 megapixels. So when it crops in tight, it's like it's enlarging the footage so much that you can see it. Um, but on this camera, it has enough resolution where it won't look as bad. You know what I mean? Because it is kind of it does have to like enlarge it uh, a little bit depending on how much you crop in. Um, the feature is cool though because you can change the crop size. There's like three different sizes: small, medium, large type thing, and you can also change like how often it moves, if it moves randomly. So it, it, you're basically simulating a cameraman. It's a cool feature, uh, it really is. So I'll show that off in the beginner's guide um, on how this works as well. I should probably write that down because um, I didn't test that yet on this camera, but it is a really cool feature. Auto framing, it's called. Small rig has some cages and bigger grips for the A6700 already. Yeah, I got the small rig cage on my A6400 right here. Let me zoom out. This is a small rig cage. I got the one with the wood grip because the grip on this camera is just too small, as you can see right here. But yeah, they make nice cages. And you can see how much bigger this grip is. It sticks out way more than this grip. It's amazing how fast small rig is at making these new cages for cameras. All right, Marine X, what's up? I recognize you from uh, one of the videos you just commented on recently. I mostly use S Cinetone. My A cam is the FX3. I want a camera as a B cam with an EVF for YouTube. I have a bunch of APS-C lenses laying around. Would you get the A6700 or wait for the A7C2? Ooh. That's a tough question. I don't know. Not sure. I'm on the fence with that. It really depends on how much. All right, well, here's the deal. If the if the A7C2 overheats like the newer Sony cameras are overheating in long form, then I wouldn't get it. Um, I would probably, well, let's see. You want the EVF, but you're going to use it as a B. You really need something that doesn't overheat, man. So, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, according to Mark, the camera crisis, he was able to record till the battery died on this camera, no problem. So, I trust his opinion. And, and Gerald got the same thing in 4K24. So, if you're using it in 4K24 in reasonable temperatures, you should have no problem as a B camera. Um, it's it's when it gets into the higher temperatures and longer recording at the higher frame rates where uh, you might have to worry. And that's why I'm worried about the A7C2 because the ZV-E1 overheats. And the A7C is a very similar camera body to the ZV-E1. It's full frame, very small, very compact. And when you have that very small, compact camera body, it's going to overheat, you know, unless Sony does some magic to it. Um, so we just have to wait and see like it, I hope when the a7c2 comes out it doesn't overheat and if that's the case They're probably gonna make it more expensive and if they make it so it doesn't overheat Then who's you know, how many people are gonna buy that instead of the FX3? So It's just so hard to say I, I don't know what Sony's gonna do um, I of course I always hope that it comes out and it won't overheat and all that and if that's the case that would probably be the way to go um, I was considering upgrading my, I'm using the A7C right here as my main camera still, and I was going to replace it with the ZV-E1, but the ZV-E1 overheats. So I was like, well, I'm not going to put it in my studio if it overheats, like what am I going to do? So if I upgrade to the A7C2, it can't overheat. Like it has to be able to sit here, you know, for like at least an hour, if not an hour and a half, if I'm doing a live stream like this, 
I'm not recording right now though, so it's not going to get as hot. But still, um, I, the beginner's guide. Sometimes I record for like an hour and a half. They take forever those videos, and I really need a camera that doesn't overheat. So that's a tough call, Marine X, because the A6700 may overheat depending on what you're doing, and the A7C2 might overheat depending on what you're doing. I just don't know uh, about that camera good enough yet. So that's a tough call. Um, but like I said, we've gotten reports that the A6700 in 4K24 can go a really long time without overheating, so you should be good there um, if you're recording in 24P. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely not the same, the small rig grip. It's not, it's not as ergonomically good. I agree. All right, small rig, new grips, blah, 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 blah. Backup for the A7 IV at weddings for bigger reach. Yeah, you'll probably be fine for that. Um, I, I used to have, when I was doing weddings, I used the Canon 40D and the Canon 5D Mark II. On the Canon 5D Mark II, I had, usually I had my 70 to 200 F 2.8 L lens on there. The crop factor camera, the 40D, I used to, what did I have on that thing? Um, no, I apologize. I take that back. So I'm visualizing it now. All right, so on my Canon 5D Mark II, I had the 24 to 105 F4L, and that was on my full frame camera. And I was using on-camera flash because it's wedding. So that was more than good enough. The, the ISO was not an issue because of the on-camera flash. Now the 40D, I did not have a flash on that. And I was using the uh, 70 to 200 F2.8 L on that, just like you're thinking for more reach. And I was able to punch in with that camera because it's faster f2.8. I was able to get away with not using the flash a lot of the time. It just depends. Uh, sometimes I did use the flash. Um, if I needed the flash, what I would do is I would just swap the lenses. I think that's what I ended up doing. So when it came to like group shots or whatever, um, or individual portraits, um, I might take the flash or switch the lenses around. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, for that purpose, I think the a6700 would work great. Um, weddings are usually climate controlled unless they're outside. So I don't think you're gonna have a problem overheating, especially if you're just doing photos. I don't, I don't see a problem with this overheating if you're just doing photos. I just don't see it happening. It's possible if you're in Florida and it's 100 degrees out, it might overheat, I don't know. Um, time will tell uh, as reports come in, but I don't think so, I really don't. I love having like a crop factor and a full frame for weddings. That was so nice having that, like being able to punch in that extra distance and plus the camera was lighter. So uh, that's, that's a really good setup. I mean, of course, like in a perfect world, it would be nice to have dual full frames, but you're carrying all this crap. It gets heavy, man. You're out there for hours and hours holding this weight. I used to have this big rig. I, I think I still have it. This big rig that would hold the camera and the flash unit went up here and it had like a handle on the side and you could like rotate the camera. It was awesome. And it had like a stand so you could put it down. But the whole thing, the whole rig, it had to weigh like at least, I don't know, five, six, seven pounds. I don't know. It was heavy, um, but it was a lot of fun to use. Uh, all right, what do we got? Uh, many thanks. Oh, you're very welcome. No problem. Trying my best. Um, hopefully, uh, my answers are helping you. I, I don't know. I don't know. Obviously, don't know everything. I just, some, I'm just speculating here on. Um, do you think there will be a surprise camera like the A7RC? I have no idea. It's almost impossible to predict what Sony's going to do. I wish I could. Um, I'm hoping. I've seen uh, on uh, Andre Sony Alpha rumors. He's a really nice guy, by the way, Andre. Um, he, uh, he's been talking about the A7C II, um, not an A7RC. So it's possible that he's mistaken, and maybe it is an A7RC or something like that. Don't know. Um, that would be cool. So um, he's reporting that Sony's going to come out with another camera pretty soon. So I have no idea what that's going to be. Um, pe some people are speculating a new flagship A1 camera because they're not updating the A1 with firmware updates. And it's pissing off a lot of people that own the A1. Uh, so I've heard that they maybe an A2 is coming out. Like people are just speculating. Nobody really knows. Um, but Sony Alpha Rumors said he got reports on the A1. A, uh, gosh, I'm like losing my brain here. The A7C2, he's gotten reports that that's coming. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, 
but as far as the R, that would be interesting. Uh, it would be an interesting twist. It would be cool. You know why? Because the uh, the RX One R Mark II. If you ever check that out, if you're not familiar with it, the Sony RX One R Mark II. That camera is awesome. It's like tiny. It's pretty small. It's like it's like a, a it's like a point and shoot with like unbelievable power and image quality. Um, I reviewed that camera and I loved it. Um, but a camera like that is kind of like a surprise camera. I feel like so maybe Sony will come out with a new one of those. You know, like for street photographers or something, kind of to compete with like the Leicas and things like that. That's kind of what the RX One R is. It's like a Leica killer. Um, it for you know. All right, what do we got here? Sony doesn't provide battery grips. I use my E10 with a cage and external 10K power bank. It works great. All right, cool, man. Yeah, they do make battery grips for the A7 IV, the A7R5, the A9, and I think the A1, um, but they don't make it for the uh, crop factor cameras. I haven't seen one. It's possible uh, maybe some of those aftermarket companies make one, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha, I gotcha. All right, uh, Roy, what's up, Roy? Uh, how do you rate the work on the A6700 relative to the A6400? Rate the work. How do you rate the work? Um, well, yeah, the A6400, again, you're kind of like, it's like this threshold here. I think it's worth upgrading. I, I revised from earlier because of the larger battery. Uh, somebody asked this question earlier, it was the A6300, and I was like, ah. So with the A6700, you are getting a much better battery and way better battery life. That is huge when it comes to like walking around all day with a camera. The autofocus is two generations better, and it's noticeably better. It's really good on the A6400, though. I use that camera all the time. It works great. Um, but it is noticeably better on the A6700. Do you really need it to be that much better is, is really the thing because the A6400 is so good, you know, like it's like, but it's better. So if you're, tr if you're doing sports or if you're trying to track birds or, you know, kids running around and stuff like that, you are going to get more keepers with the A6700 because the AI autofocus system is definitely better. Um, so, and the camera body is better. It's got the stabilization, uh, sensor stabilization built in, which is also better. Um, the camera body is a little bit heavier though. That's kind of a negative. Um, and you know, the flippy screen is also nice if you're doing stuff in front of the camera. I also like it when I'm behind the camera doing verticals. I really like using the, the flippy screen for that as well. So it's definitely worth considering. Um, I don't know if it's worth upgrading to you. Like if battery life is never an issue, then just that doesn't mean anything. If autofocus isn't an issue, then that doesn't really mean anything. So it would just come down to like camera body design and stuff. So I like the extra ergonomic controls that the A6700 offers. One of my beefs with the A66, 64, it didn't have this front dial. So you didn't have like tri-navy, you know, like tri-navy meaning if you're in manual mode, you can have one dial set to aperture, one dial set to shutter speed, and another dial set to ISO. And that's like the tri-navy system. Um, so like pretty much all pro cameras have the tri-navy system in some way, shape or form. So Sony finally brought that to the APS-C line, uh, mirrorless line, because the A77 had it, but they brought it with this A6700. So that's a pretty worthy uh, upgrade as well, having that extra dial. But again, it depends on how you use the camera. Uh, full manual users will appreciate that. Um, if you don't do that stuff, you might not even notice. So. Um, food for thought. Um, I would consider it, Roy, but image quality isn't going to be much better. It's a little bit higher resolution. Um, it, the sensor is a little bit newer, but uh, the photos are really close, like looking at them. A little bit extra uh, megapixels. Nice, though. All right, Marine X is back. We got another one. Oh, yeah. I probably need to look into the a7 IV or the a7 R5 because I film in a garage in Texas. It's normally 80 to 90 
My brother lives in Texas. Um, I really want an EVF. I may just sell those APS-C lens and get a used A7S III. Dude, A7S III uh, for the viewfinder is absolutely killer. That's probably the best B camera option that you could get if you need a viewfinder, 100%. It's never going to overheat. It's full frame. Um, you know, you can find them used. They're still expensive, but great option. That's a great video option. The other option would be, um, it, like, you need a viewfinder is the problem because... It, the ZV-E10 doesn't overheat. This thing, I have this thing above me and it just is on all the time. It never overheats, but it doesn't have a viewfinder as the downside. But the fact that it doesn't overheat, you know, the A7C in front of me, it doesn't overheat and it has a viewfinder. So you might want to consider that. It's, it's only eight bit though. It's not a 10 bit camera, the A7C, but you can save quite a bit of money. Uh, the A7S three though is definitely the better option, 100%. Good call. All right, uh, off topic, but what is your favorite picture profile in the A6700? Oh, well, for picture profiles um, these days, what I tend to do is I tend to shoot S-Log3 uh, S cine gamut. So that's how I like to record video. Um, I dabbled a little bit with um, S cine tone, but I just prefer doing the grading myself and shooting S-Log. Um, S Cine Tone looks pretty good too, but I definitely prefer to just use the uh, S Log uh, 3. And on the A6700, that's in a different spot now. Um, if you guys aren't aware, let me just show you quick. This is kind of cool how I can just show you this. Um, so if you go in the menu here and you go over to the top, it has the new menu system in here. So it has a main one and a main two when in video mode. I'm in photo mode. Let me switch it to video. All right, now I'm in video mode. You see how it has main one and main two? So if you go down here, this is where you enable log shooting. So right here, you just turn it on. And then you can change your color gamut if you want in here. But I like the uh, this one here, the cine one. But that's where you would turn it on in this camera. So it's a little bit different. It still has picture profiles. Um, but when you have log enabled, it disables it. So if I go in here and I go off, uh, back, and then I go up, now I have the picture profile option here. But if you look, whoops, if you look in here, it do, it's missing some of the options. You can see they took S log 3 out. You see how it goes from 6 to 10 there? It goes from PP6 to PP10. Uh, and then here are the LUT options. Oh, okay. It looks like we got four LUT options, Valentine, for your question before. I don't know if you could use this in, in uh, photo mode, though. But it looks like there's four uh, custom LUT options here just at a glance. But anyways, that's where the uh, log shooting is. So I, I like to use the S-Log3 S Cine Gamut one. Um, I like that one the best. But I don't really have that much experience using it, to be honest. But... That's the one I like the best. Well, in my opinion, the ZV-E10, it's more than enough. Yeah, I agree. That's a great camera. I use it. That's my overhead rig. Um, it's fantastic camera. No doubt about it. So I realize you guys are probably talking to one another as well. <laughs> You're not necessarily talking to me when you are, are throwing out these comments, and that's cool. Uh, I'm sorry. That, that's... Uh, I don't know what this is because it's in a different language, but um, yeah, sorry about that. I keep making that mistake. Where am I? Oh, there we go. Sorry about that, dude. I got gotcha. you. I keep forgetting to switch it. I apologize, guys. Really sorry about that. It's amateur hour over here. All right, imagine an A7RC with a fixed lens and a Leica M11 or Fuji, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, what you're describing is basically the RX1R Mark II, except that doesn't have a zoom lens. That is a 35mm f2 lens. So that camera is basically what you're describing, just adding a zoom lens to it. Um, and that ca the RX1R Mark II has a 42 megapixel sensor in there as well, I believe. 
Um, but yeah, zoomable lens would be nice. I agree. Sony might do that. They do like to throw stuff out every once in a while. And it's been a while um, since that RX1R Mark II came out. Um, if the, the A7RC, though, like the A7C is a mirrorless camera. So I don't think they're going to call it that if it has a fixed lens. Fixed lens cameras tend to be like RX cameras, the way Sony does it anyway. Um, I, obviously, I could be wrong, but that just seems to be how they, how they do it. Uh, let's see here. I remember now with the UV sunglasses on, you cannot see the Sony ZV. Oh, yeah, dude. Polarized glasses or UV glasses. Uh, sometimes you can't see the screen. Uh, I forgot about that. Yeah, the tempered glass. Gotcha. All right. I appreciate you clearing that up, Chris. Thanks. That's good for other people to know as well, because if you wear sunglasses, that might jack you up uh, in the field. Yeah, they're very similar. Um, like I said, the color science has changed uh, on the newer Sony cameras, but it's like subtle. So yeah, the a7 IV, it was like the best color science to date. And the a6700 appears to be the same to me. Um, but like when you go from camera to camera to camera, it's not that much of a difference. It's like very slight, um, but it is a difference. The skin tones in particular, um, the a7 IV, looks really good um and a6700 looks the same to me when i was looking at the photos i have a ton of sample photos um i could show you here in lightroom but it's kind of boring i'd rather just answer your questions and just tune into the review um uh, i'll show you a bunch of sample photos i'm not sure if i'm going to review this camera though actually maybe i will yeah there, there's uh it's it's a uh, it's pretty close there is a difference because of the full frame sensor versus crop factor but color-wise, it's very close. Hey, thanks, Maureen. Yeah, sorry about the angle. I keep forgetting to switch that. Uh, I apologize. I really appreciate the uh, super chat. Thank you very much. And uh, if you guys didn't already, if you can give me a thumbs up, I'd really appreciate that. Also, below the video in the description area, I got a bunch of links for the gear and stuff that I'm using and talking about. If you guys want to check that stuff out, um, I'd appreciate it. I wanted to share a couple of links for videos in here too. I need to find those. Um, can you press, oh, this is an interesting question. Can you press the front dial like a button? No, Roy, great question. That'd be cool if you could, but no, it only turns. Yeah, man, you understand, Arch. <laughs> Well, you know what it is? I'm using the the, Atem, the Ant, Atoms Mini switcher, so I have to actually hit the button. Um, if if it if I was using Ecamm, I would like notice a little quicker, I think. I don't know. Still debating on an upgrade from the A6400. Hacked. Interesting. Uh, that's cool. Hey, Dale. Uh, the buffer. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, the A6700 buffer is pretty good, but I don't think it's as good as the A74. It's not even close. I'm trying to think. Uh, if you guys can bear with me for a second, I can look that up for you. Um, the A6700, you can get about 59 raw files, um, and th they're large files, so that's a pretty decent number, but that's only like two seconds or couple of seconds of holding the shutter down right 11 frames per second so it's like brrr, full you know uh in jpeg mode you can get way more than that though the a7 IV has a tremendous buffer it's almost like unlimited i believe um let me see if i could find that spec quick i just can't remember what it is off the top of my head i think it says it right here in the specs Uh, let's see here. Still image capture, 14-bit, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I'm not seeing it. Darn it. I thought it was right in the specs here. All right, overview. Maybe it's in here. I remember when I reviewed this and looking into it. Um, oh, here we go. 
Dude, the buffer, 828 consecutive uncompressed raw files on the A7 IV. So the A7 IV just blows it out of the water. It's not even comparable in any way. This has almost an unlimited buffer, like 828 consecutive shots is crazy. And that's what the A7 IV offers. So far superior, uh, not even comparable. That's why we need the 7000 series crop factor camera. We need like a flagship APS-C and it will have that buffer like the A7 IV has and hopefully a stack sensor. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, all right. Is it true that clear image zoom doesn't affect the eye focus tracking on the A6700? On my previous ZVE-10, this was not the case. Yes, that's because of the AI chip. The new AI chip that's in here, uh, it adds a lot more processing power. Um, so what was happening is when you're using, when you're using uh, clear image zoom, it's like a digital zoom, but it's really powerful. So it takes like a lot of processing power because it almost, you can't even really tell that it's clear image zoom. Like it's not degraded like at all. You can go almost to like 1.5, almost to 2X before you can notice a difference. And that takes processing power. It's like upscaling it so good that you can't even tell. So, uh, like I said, processing power. That's why it wouldn't have the, the uh, really impressive IAF autofocus when in clear image zoom mode because it didn't have that processing bandwidth. So now with the AI chip, it does. So in clear image zoom, you maintain uh, IAF and the tracking abilities and stuff like that, which is awesome. That is another significant upgrade on the A6700 compared to the A6600 that I forgot to mention in the beginning of this video. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, dude, we all need more gear. You know, uh, it just is what it is. Um, I think if I just get better at it, I'll, I'll stop making that ridiculous mistake. But um, this is like the second live stream I've done in like uh, six months, probably. All right, what do we got here? Can't stress the battery issue with the older A-series, specifically in 4K. Mostly dummy battery, then connect to my ATEM in the studio. Yeah, I... I use dummy batteries in the studio and all my cameras. Uh, the a, the uh, ZV-E10 above me, dummy battery. The A7C, dummy battery. Um, they both have HDMIs going into the Anthem. Um, so this way I can switch the camera angles. I normally have a third camera over here to, to my, you know, that way. Um, but I don't have that hooked up right now. And uh, everything goes into the Anthem and then I can switch. And then with Ecamm, uh, Ecamm allows you to pick the Blackmagic Anthem as one of your inputs. So I, I have that selected. Now, if I switch to like my desktop or like my Mac, you know, on mic, on camera mic, I can do that via Ecamm, but I can't, it, it just gets so like confusing, you know? Um, when I, like, Ecamm is just ridiculous. Like there's so many windows, it's like um, crazy. But I hear you. Um, hey, what's up, Brandon? Thanks, man. Appreciate you stopping by, dude. Check out Brandon's channel. This guy is really cool. He's super funny too. Um, him and my buddy Josh actually have a podcast you guys have got to check out. It's called 16 Stops. Uh, just search 16 Stops in YouTube and their podcast will come up. It's fantastic and uh, really, really good. Uh, Brandon's hilarious. Um, it, it's, it's a really uh, good podcast. So um, that pretty much wraps up the questions here. Do um, you guys got any more questions? Fire away. Um, I'll give you guys a, a couple of minutes to ask a few more questions. In the meantime, though, I just wanted to switch to my uh, laptop screen here. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, just give me a second here. Current application. That should do it. If I switch to that, I should switch to Ecamm. Or uh, I should switch to Lightroom there for you. All right. Let's see. I, think I took a bunch of shots. All right, it should switch to Lightroom. Just give it a second. Um, I just took a couple of snapshots. Let's see. This is kind of cool, like a lotus plant. This was with that 70 to 200 lens. Look at how sharp this is, guys. This is unbelievable sharpness um, with that new 70 to 200 macro. 
Um, I should talk about that more. I'm supposed to be talking about that lens in this video also. Look at this beast. Let me cover my face. Oh, I have my laptop screen up, so... Oh, I could you'd still see on the little screen. Um, but yeah, this lens is so sick. Uh, absolutely awesome optic. Uh, really loving it so far. It's a little bit slower with the f4 aperture, but I don't really mind because this macro ability is so ridiculous and so welcomed. The minimum focus distance is what allows you to get so close to subjects like this. And this flower was small. It was only like the size of a quarter. And, you know, you can get so close with uh, a lens like this. I got like a B, you know, it's not the greatest shot, but it's okay. Oh, there was like a duck. Look at this duck. And you can just see how sharp that is. Like it's re razor blade sharp, this new 70 to 200. And this was on the uh, 6700. Um, I took these pictures, just another flower, it's another one. Oh, I went to a food truck and got this incredible um, chicken Philly cheesesteak. It was unbelievable. Uh, let me see here. I took a bunch of shots yesterday. Oh, this was with the 70 to 350 millimeter G lens. Um, so I zoomed in and took a couple of shots of this little hummingbird thing. A few snapshots. I didn't go through these yet. I just imported them. Uh, let me go to the end though, because I took a bunch of shots. Oh, they're from today. Never mind. Here we go. These are from today. I took a couple of shots today. This was using the 16 to 55 millimeter. And you could just see, I mean, straight off the camera, this is a JPEG because Lightroom isn't accepting the raw files yet. But um, the image quality is looking really good for sure. I mean, you could see here on this sign, it's just remarkable. Here's a good shot, just shows a little bit of the background blur, uh, focusing on these flowers and stuff like that. Just a couple monuments. These are just like snapshots. I was just walking down the road, taking a few pictures, trying to sh show you that background separation you can get with a lens like this at f2.8. Um, so this was 55 millimeter f2.8 and, you know, pretty good separation there. Unbelievable sharpness. This lens is really good quality. Um, it does have a lot of distortion at 16 millimeter though, but you won't see that if you're shooting in JPEG because the camera fixes it. Look at this bike I saw. It had a motor on it. I saw this today on the sidewalk. I couldn't believe it. Really cool, right? It's got a little gas tank. It's got like a whole system here. So I thought that was cool. Uh, then I came across this old Impala. Look at this beast. Impala SS. I don't know. This is like a 1960s something or, or whatever. Uh, here's the front of it. Sweet looking car. Just a couple snapshots. I just focused on this doorknob to get maximum uh, butter. So I was going for maximum butter here. And uh, this lens produces some really good, uh, really good out of focus, no doubt. Just a bunch of stuff here. This was uh, like a spillway. I was just zooming in on, taking a couple of shots. This is a pretty cool, oh, I was taking an HDR here. That's what this is. Breakwell Steel. This guy is like a genius metal builder or whatever you call it, a metal sculptor artist. And look at what he does with metal. It's unbelievable what this guy does. And uh, the detail is just ridiculous. I mean, this guy's got like a cigarette in his mouth. You could just, you could almost see his expression. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, remarkable. This guy's filing his nails. Look at this one. He's got like a doorknob for an eye, like his brain. Look at his brain. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? This guy is so cool. He has these sculptures like where I live. They're like, they randomly pop up and uh, I really enjoy checking them out. So like I said, I took these shots today. They're just snack snapshots. This is him, ZachMax.com. Never met the guy or anything, but I love his work. Um, I've taken photos of it for years now and uh, super impressed with his stuff. There's another guy. Looks pretty cool. No, nope, fan just fell over again. All right, let me get out of here. Let me see if uh, anybody ans asked any more questions. I just got to switch back to Black Magic. Nope, not that one. This one. All right, I should be back on the screen. All right, Brandon, there we are. Uh, yeah, dude. If 
Yeah, Brandon, of course, man. Absolutely. Uh, we all like nerding out to this gear. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You guys are really good, though. Super entertaining. Um, all right, let's see what we got here. Does it really make that much of a difference filming with 60 megabit per second instead of 100 megabit? Well, uh, it depends on if you're shooting in log or not. Um, it's just how much it's being compressed. So, yeah, it, it, it's going to matter if you want to push your video footage in post-processing. If you don't do that, then it's not going to make that much of a difference. But because the data, the amount of data is less, um, if you're like in Final Cut and you're trying to like, you know, push the colors or bring the highlights down or bring the shadows up a little bit, um, the lower bit rate, uh, you're going to have less like leeway. Like you're going to have less information to work with. So that's kind of where it really matters. What matters more than anything, though, is shooting an S-Log um, as opposed to like a Rec. 709 format, which is what, um, that's when you just record and it kind of looks like a photo already. Log, when you're shooting log, it looks more like when you're shooting in RAW with photos. It's like the image is much more flat. So there's way more information in the log footage and you want that higher bitrate output so you can manipulate the footage uh, in post. Now, again, if you're getting perfect exposure, perfect everything, you're not really gonna need to manipulate it that much. You could probably get away with a lower bit rate um, to your point, but I always try to go with like, for the most part, um, the higher bit rate. I don't go for the maximum bit rate on my a7 IV. There's an SI mode and that's like a really high bit rate. I don't use that one. I use the HS um, bit rate um, because it, the image quality looks about the same. Um, supposedly the HS is harder to edit uh, on computers, but my Mac can handle it no problem. So I just use HS mode as opposed to the SI mode. Now the A6700 also has that. It has the SI and the HS. So I would use the HS at the highest bit rate would be my recommendation. Um, if you're doing longer form recording and you're not doing post-processing on the footage, you could probably get away with using the lower bit rate uh, for a lot of stuff. I noticed that 100 megabits, when I punch in and edit, it looks much better, less than uh, grainy and messy. Yeah, there you go. Um, it just depends on if how much you're gonna like manipulate the footage and stuff like that. So, I mean, I never noticed a difference just looking at it uh, when it when it's not log, but uh, it's it, there's definitely gonna be a difference uh, to some degree. Yeah, man, that bike was cool, right? <laughs> I thought that Impala was cool too. I really, I kind of wanted to hang in. The, the window on that Impala was open and I, I really wanted to like, like go in the window and take pictures, but I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, the art is crazy. Uh, that Zach Max guy is ridiculous. I have, a, I have a couple of more photos from that guy's sculptures that are down the road from my house um, that I actually took with the, uh, that, What's the oh this lens guys this lens is ridiculous. This new Viltrox 75 millimeter f1.2 lens is unbelievable. This this lens is unbelievable. Uh, I, I this is what I'm gonna record tomorrow. I gotta review this. Uh, I can't believe how good that lens is. It's remarkable and. I didn't use, I used it on my a6400. I don't think I put it on the a6700 at all. I might've uh, yesterday actually. I don't, I don't know if, if I go into Lightroom here, let me see. I took uh, these photos. What camera was I using though? I got so many cameras. Yeah, a6400. Well, I could still show you uh, one or two. Uh, let me switch this back to that. Okay, that should be showing you Lightroom now. So here's another one of those sculptures, those um, Zach Max sculptures. And the guy makes such the coolest stuff. Look at this one. This is insane. You can just see all the different tools. And th these are painted, so they look even cooler. Um, here's another one. And again, just the texture detail. You could see these faces like look kind of sort of like that other um, you know, structure, that other one we were just showing you, they were all rusty. These are painted, but you can see the similarities. Like it's obviously the same guy. Look at this background butter. Look at the butter on this, from this lens. 
unbelievable, this Viltrox lens, guys. Um, but anyways, I'm not supposed to be talking about that. I'm supposed to be talking about the uh, 70 to 200. So I have a couple uh, other shots I took with that thing. Let me see. Um, yeah, I really didn't take that many shots with it. I just got a bunch of silly flowers and stuff. That that's about it. I got I got to do a lot more. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna record on the uh, A7 IV. I'm gonna test the 70 to 200 like the rest of the way. So probably next week I'll use this setup and then I'll come out with a video on this lens. You know, a week or two from now. Uh, right now I'm just focusing on the A6700 and I really got to get that Viltrox uh, lens review done tomorrow. So that's pretty much the game plan. Um, but I'm going to have to get going here. Um, yeah, Brandon, that'd be awesome, dude. Uh, I'd love to go on. You know, you guys are doing a great job so far, though. You haven't quite got to the guest uh, uh, portion, I guess, of your journey with the podcast. But uh, that last one on red cameras was unbelievable. I, I learned so much. It was it was really good. I'm looking forward to uh, the one you guys are doing. Uh, Josh told me you guys are supposed to be recording Sunday or something, so... I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, Viltrox also makes a 27 uh, millimeter. I have not used that lens. Um, I have a 23 millimeter f1.4 Viltrox. That's really good, um, but it's not near as good as these newer Viltrox lenses. The uh, the Viltrox 13 millimeter f1.4 is phenomenal, uh, and this one here, this new one, uh, the 75, phenomenal. Um, the 27, I don't know about that one. I haven't used it. Uh, that'd be cool if that's on the same level as these newer Viltrox lenses because it's remarkable what they're putting out for the money. Um, they're really starting to, I don't know, they're like crushing it, to be honest. All right, what do we got here? Regarding the overheating issues, I noticed different experiences in general. My ZV-E10, for example, did have overheating issues sometimes in rather cool surroundings. That's interesting. Yeah, I've never had the A7 or the ZV-E10 overheat on me. Um, but like I said, my studio is about in between 70 and 76, maybe. It like varies. I usually have the air conditioner on, but it's so loud. I don't have it on right now. It's one of those old units that pops out of the house. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, listen, if you're in hot conditions outside, I think any of these cameras that don't have fans uh, are going to overheat eventually. So it's just a matter of what you're doing. And the ZV-E10 is a small camera body, but just from my own experience, um, I have this thing on this overhead rig and it, it's never overheated on me. And I've had it on for hours, you know? Um, so it just, it just depends on what you're doing, what temperature. Um, I heard if you're recording with a memory card and an HDMI cable, it'll heat up faster. Like if you're also outputting HDMI, um, the camera will heat up faster. So, and of course, if you have the screen out, it'll allow the camera to cool off a little bit more. So those things may or may not help um, when it comes to that stuff. Uh, filming in 4K for four minutes? Dude, I can't believe it overheats. I've never had a problem like that. I could only, I could imagine if you're in 100 degree temperatures, it doing that maybe, but regular temperatures that sounds crazy do you have your auto power off temperature set to high make sure you have your auto power off temperature set to high uh in the camera uh, i have a feeling you must not have it set to high if that's the case um high will allow the camera to get way more warm before the before it turns off so highly recommend setting that um too high so that's pretty much it, guys. I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, I got to get going. It's been almost two hours. I really appreciate you guys stopping by. Listen, we had some great questions. Um, I had a lot of fun. Uh, I'm starting to get a little bit more used to Ecamm. Obviously, I still suck at switching the camera angles when needed, but... Oh, 45 minutes. Okay, that sounds better. Yeah, 45 sounds about right. I could see that, uh, 4K. Uh, it just depends, like, what, you know, what temperature um, and things like that. Um, but yeah, that makes sense. 45 minutes. Sorry. He just put that up here. I'll throw it up on the screen quick. 45. Yeah. So anyways, um, like I said, I, I really appreciate you guys checking out the video 
and uh, you know the live stream. I'll leave this live stream up if you weren't able to catch it all. Um, I feel like I'm, a lot of it is just me like babbling, but I'm, I'm trying to answer questions as best I can. So it's a lot of fun uh, for those of you. I, I appreciate it. It seems like some of you are getting uh, some help, which just makes me happy. So um, that's what it's all about for me. I really like helping people. And that's why I love doing this YouTube stuff. It's super rewarding uh, reading the comments and, and people like, thank you. You know, like it's, it's a good feeling helping people, you know. And plus, it's fun learning these new cameras and everything. I always enjoy the process of learning a new camera and trying to figure out what a lens can do, what it's capable of, you know, things like that. So, again, I appreciate it, guys. I'm, uh, I got to get going. But uh, the Viltrox lens review is coming out next. The A6700 stuff will be following that. Uh, then I'm going to work on the 70 to 200 lens. So you can expect that stuff in the near future. And uh, thanks again for uh, tuning in. I'll catch up with you guys next time. Take care.